Thank you very much, and thanks to the UBS International Center for Economics and Society. Uh, I greatly enjoyed the conversations this morning and now, and uh, I feel very lucky to have been invited. So thank you very much. Throughout the morning and now, um, there is one important factor that is there, and that is, uh, but I want to make it explicit. A lot of what we have been talking this morning and now has to do with power, has to do with political power. Populism is a way of obtaining and retaining power. And I think we need to make that explicit. It is also self-serving because that's what I talk about. That's, a, that's a, the book I wrote and I continue to examine the nature of power in the 21st century, how it is changing, how is it acquired, used and lost. The central message of my book on the end of power is that uh, in, nowadays power has become easier to acquire, harder to use and easier to lose. The barriers to entry to, uh, that kept challengers to the powerful out have, are falling. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, massive concentrations of power no longer exist in the banking sector, in war, in society, in politics, uh, in wealth. Uh, you have uh, people that are very powerful. My argument, however, is that these people with power now have more probabilities of being challenged uh, by others, by newcomers. and. Um, and they have, there, are, there are myriad forces that are fragmenting, degrading, weakening power. Power exists, but it is harder to use and uh, easier to lose. One of the tools used by politician, mostly, politicians, mostly in, in democracies, is populism, but not populism alone. One of the points I, I, I felt I needed to make was that, from my perspective, uh, populism is not an ideology. And an ideology requires uh, much more than a simple us versus them kind of approach. An ideology has to have provide a worldview, uh, an answer to a lot of other problems that uh, populism doesn't uh, deal with, that doesn't know how to deal with. So my point is, again, that populism is just a tactic. It's a tactic to counter the forces of fragmentation of power, the forces that are diluting power, the forces that are making power less safe and less controlled by those who have it. But populism is not alone in this thing. Populism belongs to a triad of factors that I think are very important and explain uh, a lot of behaviors around the world. The other two factors are polarization and the end of truth. Uh, the polarization is, uh, has always existed. Uh, societies are often uh, polarized and they have wedges, like the professor have mentioned. They have divisions and they can be of a wide variety of, 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 of sources. They, they can, the wedges can be uh, identity, can be religion, can be ideology, can be money, can be uh, uh, rural versus uh, urban. There's a wide variety of forces of uh, polarization. The difference now is that, globalization, is that polarization has gone global. Try to look at, the, at recent elections that have not been highly polarized. Uh, landslides in elections are an endangered species. They do exist, but are very rare. The normal outcome in an election in today's world is polarized, is about 50-50, it's 48-52, and that makes very hard to govern. Mm. Around the world, you have the degrees of polarizations that, are, uh, that make it impossible to govern. Uh, and, and create governments. Yesterday we saw the elections in Spain, the fourth election, the fourth general elections in the last four years. We are seeing what happens, uh, what is happening in the United uh, Kingdom with Brexit and, 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 and the kind of polarization that that entails. Uh, we see it in Israel and the incapacity to forming government. We see it around the world. Take a look and you will see that polarization is a very important uh, factor. Polarization is stoked by populists, but also by, by other factors, of course, by technology, by globalization, and others. Um, and, and in fact, has a lot to do 
with uh, uh, what we know is a main cause of social anxiety, social conflict, which is rapid societal change. And we know we have been living through rapid societal change. Change that has been driven, again, by technology, by globalization, by immigration, by changes in mindsets, uh, by having the largest uh, middle class in history. N never before in human history have so many individuals belonged to a middle class. Now, the middle class in China is not like the middle class in Switzerland. It's much poorer, but it is a middle class in the sense that it's no longer under the poverty line. And, and that's true everywhere, and those middle classes uh, come with expectations and demands and hopes, and uh, they require their governments to provide good services opportunities at a speed that governments have a hard time fitting. So that creates all social change, all changes create uh, uh, inequities, create um, the, the um, imbalances. Change is, by definition, uh, uh, this, it, it creates disarray, it creates uh, confusion, it creates anxiety. So we are living in an era in which we all know that there's something big going on, and something big can, can have to, may have to do with politics, we may have to do with climate change, with automation, artificial intelligence. We know that there are, there's a, something big brewing. But we don't know how my family, me, my company, my country, my city is going to end up as a result of these massive societal changes. And that creates great anxiety and also creates and feeds strong demand for answers, for anchors, for safety. Uh, what Luigi was saying about the providing uh, security, both economic security and identity security. And, uh, and, and that creates is the, is, the, is the context in which polarization and populism uh, uh, becomes uh, so common and so global. Uh, it is very important to note that uh, the, 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 the level of... Uh, we have always had rapid societal change. The Industrial Revolution created rapid societal change in a sliver of countries. Not in all countries, you know, that in many ways you could argue that the Industrial Revolution was a European uh, phenomenon. That it didn't touch Africa, it didn't touch Latin America, it didn't touch parts of Asia. Now it's different. The societal change that we're experimenting now is global and it's touching individuals everywhere from little hamlets in Africa, to the mega cities in Asia, to the centers uh, uh, in Europe and everywhere else. And that creates, again, uh, a, a great anxiety and a great uh, need to have safety, to have predictability, to have less uh, uh, uncertainty. Uh, this creates, the, as I said, the, the opportunities for politicians that are willing to tell people whatever is needed for, to calm them and to get support. Populism is not uh, uh, more than uh, offering a set of uh, 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 items that need to be checked. And one of the main items is promising you don't care if it will happen or not. The list that we saw about Italy pro promising, you know, the end of poverty, the boom, economic boom, the end of immigration, they're all lies. They're all lies. And he knew that he was lying. And so the only worse thing uh, than populists is the followers who believe, you know, the charlatans who don't pay any major attention to, to try to screen what is it that they tell, they're being told, to think twice about the veracity of what they're being told. And that brings me to the word of the year of 2016, according to Oxford Dictionary, which is the end of truth. The notion that societies are no longer capable of differentiating what is a fact and what is not, what is real and what is false, what is a lie and what is truth. Um, it, it is the, this post-truth uh, era, but the, 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 of the, of the definition of that is, is a political culture and circumstances in which objective facts 
uh, become less influential in shaping public opinion and than those that appeal to emotion and personal beliefs. There is, that creates uh, one of three wars I'm going to talk about. One is the war on facts. Uh, the other is a war on checks and balances, and the third is a war on liberal democracy. But the war on facts creates this societal environment which you, don't know, you no longer know what's truth. And then you tend to believe what is more comfortable to you, to your prejudices, to your tribe, to your family, to what, it, what feels good rather than what is true. Alan Rosbringer is uh, the former editor of The Guardian. He recently wrote, we are discovering that society can't function if we can't agree on what is a fact and what is a lie. We can have debates, laws, courts, or governance if there is no agreement about what is it real and what isn't. And around the world, that confusion is permeating all levels of society. And so the... These three factors, populism, polarization, and post-truth, are at the service of power, and at the service of trying to retain power and contain the forces that are undermining and fragmenting power. So if you want to follow the recipe that is now common, you have just to stoke divisions, the them against us that have, has been discussed this morning, the, na the, na the notion of having a very strong anti-something uh, approach and dividing society uh, in that way. That man makes uh, the division needs to be fed, and very often that division is fed by lies. Lying is a main instrument of populists. All governments lie, no governments lie as much as populists. <laughs> then, you know, after stoking division, spread lies. And that's, uh, again, uh, the, 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 that comes with a disdain and a war on experts. Experts and academics and scientists have facts, have numbers, have statistics. And so that's how you see very often uh, how those in power are deriding, insulting, uh, uh, and criticizing experts. Donald Trump is a practitioner of that. In England, we saw Michael Gove, uh, uh, as you remember, he was a member of parliament. At the time, he was a minister when the, he was offered some, a study by experts, by top econ economists about the economic consequences of Brexit, he said he wouldn't read it because the, America, the, the British people have had enough of experts. So experts are very uncomfortable for populists because they have data. And it's very hard to lie if you have uh, evidence. But nothing is as bad uh, for populists as journalists. <laughs> so, not only is the, the, the post-truth era needs to delegit delegitimize uh, experts, but also, and notably so, it needs to delegitimize uh, journalists. Like the other factor that is very important for populists is that you need to demonize the past. Everything that came before is a catastrophe. Everything that came before is corrupt, uh, is uh, unjust, is the reason why nothing works. And uh, so I am here, the populist that will bring you prosperity and, different, and a different way of doing things that will be better for you. And that implies the need to delegitimize rivals. Part of the polarization is that rivals, or political rivals, are no longer compatriots that think differently. Rivals are uh, aliens uh, that uh, don't deserve to have a space in the public discourse and in politics. All that uh, uh, creates what I, what I said before, the three wars are the war on facts, the war on checks and balances, and it, that happens very stealthily, and you can see how in a lot of countries you have the deliberate undermining of democracy by people that have been democratically elected. 
undermining, the, the, the trying to get control of uh, uh, the media through to, sub, to, to stealthy ways, trying to control Congress, and, and, so, and so on. And all that yields uh, a problem for uh, liberal democracy, which uh, has, of course, uh, its, its threats. I ran out of time, but I was asked also to give some uh, suggestions as to what to do with all this. I don't have concrete prescriptions about uh, how to deal with populism, because as we saw, it is a very diverse, different uh, kind of phenomenon that cannot be addressed with uh, uh, all, one, one, uh, only one aspect. But I do have one very strong feeling, and that is the need to strengthen political parties, which will come uh, as a surprise to many who have seen how uh, uh, worthy of the region are political parties around the world. What happens is the end of the Cold War is that political parties have become uh, less competitive in attracting uh, idealists, and NGOs have been very, very competitive in attracting uh, NGOs. And so around the world, we have seen the decline of the prestige, the attractiveness of political parties. Uh, they are seen as corrupt, slow-moving, bureaucratic, magnet for opportunists and corrupt individuals. Instead, NGOs, non-governmental organizations of movements, are purer, are uh, more transparent, are more inclusive, are better. Ask any 25-year-old idealist that wants to change the world if he wants to join you in going to, uh, belonging to a party, to a political party. And, you know, they won't. Uh, but instead, if you offer to belong to an NGO that fights against uh, a butterfly that is in danger of extinction in Indonesia, they will may join you. Uh, so there is this attractiveness of NGOs and this repulsion of political parties, which is very bad. I don't believe that you can have a democracy based on NGOs or on movements. I believe that you need political parties that are permanent, that are not uh, electoral machines to bring to power a specific individuals. I believe that they, these should be organizations that have a long view of how to govern or wanting to govern, that are training grounds for future politicians and cabinet members and all that, that um, they are capable of articulating and giving voice uh, to people that have lost their voice. A lot of the street protests you see around the world are nothing more than manifestations of the collapse of political parties. These are people that have grievances, that want government to change, that want things to change, and they don't have ways to communicate that other than going to the streets and blocking them or fighting the riot police. And again, that is a failure of political parties. Hmm. Uh, it is easier said than done, but political parties need to modernize, need to emulate and understand how do NGOs manage to attract and retain idealists, how uh, to make them part of a long-term uh, vision for the country, and, uh, and, and becoming uh, a more permanent fixture in the uh, in the political debates. That may uh, be an antidote for uh, populists, uh, but of course, there is a danger that uh, these parties, as has happened, uh, can be taken over by populists. Mm -hmm. But the solution to that is not uh, more populism, but more democracy. Thank you very much. <clears throat>